I'm John Agar, and I'm going to be talking about this place. I don't know whether anyone recognises it or can tell me a story about it. Anyone been there? No. It's not the Lake District. It's not too far away. So this is a place called um, this is the Cow Green Reservoir, and it's in the Upper Teesdale. Um, and I think it's quite significant that w I know. That Upper Moorland can look similar, but I think it's also quite interesting that we don't immediately recognise it or that we um, can tell immediate stories about it. Now, I had a choice. I could either tell a coherent story, um, a single narrative, um, one that made sense of this site and its significance. Um, and uh, Mary Morgan, Norton Wise's paper, which... Um, Dominic has pointed to us a, a few times, actually says this is one of the main things that narratives do for science. It adds um, coherence and it's a way of unfolding uh, a story and those are very important. But actually, if we did that, then what we end up doing is not being able to focus on some of the incoherences of narratives when they're told by different people for different reasons at different times. So what I'm going to try and do is actually unpick uh, four, I think, different narratives told about this site um, that I think collectively we need to um, understand. Uh, OK. So the first um, set of uh, <laughs> uh, narratives is those told by bureaucrats and scientists in the mid-20th century. And to get to that point, I just want to show you a website. It's a website I spend quite a lot of time on myself. It's produced by Natural England, right, and it's a geographical information system, and basically it's a way of homing in on sites um, uh, of all kinds of interest uh, uh, that are interesting for natural reasons or for cultural reasons, heritage reasons and others. Um, can I have the website up as well? Yeah. Now what it does is I've put up here um, I've a, uh, dots which represent either national nature reserves or sites of special scientific interest. Um, no, it's disappeared. Right. Are you both? I do, never mind. Um, so hang on, it's going to be confusing because it's off the screen. So Don't worry, go back. Go back to the, the um, presentation, we'll carry on here. Now, what I wanted to show you there is just how many dots there were. And once you zoom in, you realise that an awful large portion of, of, the, uh, of the countryside is, is uh, bureaucratically defined in, for reasons of it being, in particular, a site of special scientific interest. Uh, and slightly more rare are national nature reserves, which, if you like, are super important special sites of scientific interest. They're ones that um, were, have been delineated and uh, um, uh, mapped out for particularly um, their interest in natural history, but also to scientists. Now, what that, where that system comes from is from the mid-20th century, where in the sort of the planning moment, the planning political moment of the 1930s and 1940s, but particularly immediately after the Second World War, where planning seemed to be the route to reorganising a new society, conservation became defined in terms of bureaucratic processes whereby particular sites were defined as being of interest to scientists and therefore public money could be justified mm -hmm. in preserving that system. And that gave us a land system of, of nature reserves um, and of these sites of special scientific interest, which I think are, are a particularly interesting uh, aspect of... of, of this interconnection between history of science and history of um, nature in this country. And the place I showed you at the beginning, Cal Green, um, is a national nature reserve, is a site of special scientific interest. Um, so this is a quotation from somebody who writes about the politics of nature, basically saying this point, ever since the 1940s, Wildlife conservation in the UK has leaned heavily on this association in the official mind with science. And in doing so, it has gained from the privileged status 
of s that science held in popular culture in post-war Britain. The argument that conservation was necessary for science justified public spending on conservation. So this is one set of narratives. They're, they're ones that, 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 that pull on an immense uh, and long history of networks of botanists, of geologists, who have identified what's interesting about particular sites, have accumulated an immense amount of knowledge, um, and are able to identify spring gentians or sugar limestone and make that part of a narrative, which is a bureaucratic narrative, which classically takes the form of documents such as this, which is a notification, a legal form, which says that this site should be take a particular legal status because of its uh, particular uh, interesting aspects of uh, either uh, natural history or geology, essentially. Okay, so that's one set of I think very important narratives. Ones which set up a system um, for for a bureaucratic and legal system um, uh, within this country within which nature uh, finds itself. Now, a second narrative um, concerns industry and politics, and it is all about um, what happens at that site of Cow Green. Now, Cow Green is the reservoir, and it's at the very top end, the source, really, of the River Tees. The River Tees flows down. This is the North Sea up here. This is the Upper Tees Dale in the Heights, flowing down to the North Sea, and it comes out on Teesside, and Teesside is one of Britain's techno-environmental landscapes par excellence. Right, this is Billingham, um, at night, beautiful picture. Um, little aside, many of you might know this, Billingham, that uh, northeast industrial landscape was the Ridley Scott's inspiration, visual inspiration for uh, Blade Runner. Right? So what it's going to be, is a, it's a story about what happens here in terms of the interests of, of the techno-environmental complex of chemical industry down there and what happens up the other end of the river in Upper Teesdale. So uh, River Tees, Teesside, Billingham, home of ICI, the chemical combine, the biggest employer in the, com in the, in the area, um, but also an area which had some of the highest unemployment rates in the country. Right? So industrial, but with high, un un high unemployment um, and a, 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 a sharp sense and a memory of the depression, of, the, of, of, the, um, of un mass unemployment. ICI's core business um, was making ammonia here, uh, but that was in trouble. Um, the old process started with coke, that's another coal story, um, and that was getting more expensive. Other countries were producing ammonia by this stage from natural gas. But by 1963, ICI research chemists had a new trick, something called the NAFTA steam reforming process. It promised lots of ammonia, it promised economic prosperity, but it needed lots of water. And therefore the question is, where should that come from? Now the law at that time pretty much allowed manufacturers to set the demand for water. So the ICI could ask the water board to, um, uh, to, to, to source a supply. The um, water board was made up of of essentially largely Labour politicians um, or appointees who themselves remembered unemployment and took employment as one of their major aims. Right? Um, and when they looked and their attention first to where they could find the water from, they looked at the Tees Valley and their um, uh, attention was brought, drawn to the water supply as it emerged up here. You could build a, uh, a reservoir around the town of Middleton, the old lead town, um, but that would have uh, flooded um, uh, agricultural land. You could build it right at the top, up a cow green, um, but that might be 
expensive and uncertain, and ICI was keen as possible to get it underway as quickly as possible, or you could build it where it is on the map there uh, in Cal Green, which is precisely in the middle of the area where the botanists said were the most rare and most unique assemblage of flora um, um, that uh, they were they knew of. So ICI wanted Cal Green Reservoir built as soon as possible. Its opponents, led by botanists, challenged private bills as they went to the Houses of Parliament. Uh, on one side was jobs and for an agricultural land and industry, on the other, a unique flora validated by scientific authority, underpinned by this idea that it's a site of scientific, special scientific interest, written in law and justified by the science. This is a little uh, excerpt from the parliamentary debate, um, and it features the Cambridge botanist Harry Godwin being questioned by. Uh, uh, um, uh, essentially legally, um, and he is not doing very well in this um, inquisition. The root problem here is these big authorities in botany would not have worked directly on the Teesdale flora, their areas were elsewhere, and therefore they could easily be asked questions which made them look uncertain, like have you ever, how often have you studied this flora? Well actually I haven't studied this flora and so on and so forth. This led to an undermining of some of the botanical authority here and some of the scientific justification could be picked away by ICI's um, lawyers. Now that was a wedge which um, ICI was able to undermine the science that underpinned the SSSIs which underpinned the bureaucratic, bureaucratic management of nature. Um, to wrap up this part of the story, in 1970, Cal Green was approved. In 1972, uh, a significant portion of the flora, the interesting bit of the flora is sort of over here and some of it's now underwater. This is the dam that regulates the water, um, so it produces a steady amount of water for the chemical industry many, many miles downstream, um, but it's completed in 72 um, and the, uh, the, a precedent has been created for uh, challenging the scientific underpinnings of, um, of SSSIs. Within a decade, ICI's process is going to be obsolete anyway. Now the narrative in all this well, there's a narrative constructed for the courts. There's a narrative about the present and the future, a present of unemployment, a future of prosperity, um, or a present of, 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 of existing plants and a future of flooded plants. Um, ultimately, the industrial narrative is stronger than that that could be built by the scientists and had to do the scientist authority was receding uh, in the 60s and 70s. There's a clash here, a clash of narratives. Um, here's a quotation uh, from the House of Lords debate about the public discussion and how it seemed to Lord Kennett here, a head-on clash between the quantifiable and the unquantifiable, between industry, which is used to be giving precise figures, and, a, and a, an alliance of pure science botany in that case, and those who want the preservation of natural beauty, neither of which in the nature of things can be expected to answer the question of what, when, how much, with any precision. Now, there's more, two more analysis I'm going to quickly introduce. One, uh, I'm rather, well, I'm calling it the genius loci. It's a person. It's a person of the place. Now, from the 1960s onwards, as the Cal Green proposals developed, um, a local botanist called Margaret Bradshaw, started work on the Upper Teesdale flora, and she's wor been working ever since. She's an ever-present person in these very, very high um, moors of Upper Teesdale, um, uh, either doing the, the um, surveying herself or overseeing the surveying work that's going on there. I was there this year, and I was lucky enough to be 
shown the flora on a botanical excursion by Margaret Bradshaw herself. She's 94, 94 years old. And the story that she tells it is a story of the rarity of the plants and the geology, but it, there's an extra layer too, and it's one of an a narrative of equivalence, of value. That it's not just that the, there are these plants, the upper Teesdale assemblage of flora that she, she, is, she is the, uh, the expert on, but there's also an equivalence with, in value in terms of, to quote her, this is like, our, this dates from about 10 to 12,000 years ago. It's existed there continuously. It is part of a heritage that is older than Stonehenge or Durham Cathedral, i.e. there's an equivalence to, in terms of cultural value, to um, uh, um, human-made um, cultural achievements such as Stonehenge or, um, uh, or Durham Cathedral. And the, that kind of narrative is one that is both past, present and future, because it's about, it's linking it to equivalence to of a 10 to 12,000 year past. It's about an equivalent in terms of, of, of human achievements since then. It's about the present threats. It's about what will happen in the future. Okay. The fourth narrative is the, how the nature writers have written about this. So one nature writer in particular, Mark Cocker, he's one of the leading nature writers uh, in Britain. Uh, Here's how he describes himself as a nature writer. I'm usually branded a nature writer, whatever that means. I'm committed to the literary genre in which I operate. It's a book form usually viewed as a merging of lyrical responses to nature with the political, scientific, ethical. It's a blend of the private and the public, the emotional and the scientific. So it's, it's emotional, it's emotional cultural response to uh, uh, the non, the, the non-human, the wild, um, uh, uh, and place. Now he wrote a book, this book here, Our Place, it was published last year, and he asked, why have we got this paradox? Um, essentially, it's a paradox which he sees mass involvement in organisations such as the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, we like to visit nature reserves, we like to watch nature documentaries on TV, we love nature. Um, there are lots of indicators that seem to suggest that, yet wildlife is being destroyed, habitats are being destroyed. What explains this paradox? And the book is an, is an attempt to get, to try and resolve that paradox. Um, uh, and it's, a, it's a, in some sense a, a bitter book because he thinks the destruction has been immense. And it's a puzzle, puzzling book because he's trying to figure out what's going on um, and what does he, how does he sort of account for it. Well, he puts the Cal Green episode right at, as the moment when this could have been different. Here's what he writes. The crisis of Cal Green, the building of the reservoir, helped to explain away the apparent paradox. If there was ever a place that should have been beyond the reach of development and industrial intrusion. So this is a narrative about how should techno uh, environments and, uh, and natural environments intersect and change. If it should ever be beyond the reach of development and industrial intrusion, it was here. If we should ever once have opted for nature, then Cal Green was the place, the moment to have made an exception. That we did not and could not do that is the measure of all our losses. Perhaps there should be a plaque that reads, Cal Green Reservoir, British Nature was lost here, 1964 to 71. It's sarcastic. It's, in on most nature writing, there is an element of depression which is uh, very close. You see it in Mark Cocker's writing, you see it in others, and you see it here. There's a sarcasm which is desperate, actually, at times. OK, so that's four narratives. Um, they don't run together easily. They, 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 some are pointing forward, some are pointing backwards, some are uh, 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 l located in 
are in marshalling scientific evidence, some are legalistic uh, arguments that are meant just to turn an argument at a certain time, at a certain place, um, in Parliament or in court. Um, there's a lot going on here. But I'll make just one or two observations and then I'll finish, Dominic. Yep. The first is, well, what do we do with this sort of claim to significance, right? For Mark Cocker, this narrative is all important. This was the moment when British nature could have, was lost. And I was not too sure what I could make of it. Especially with Harriet in our audience. Harriet wrote a, book, wrote a great book called The Dawn of the Green. Dawn of Green. Uh, about Thirlmere in the late 19th century. Another story of a fight about water. One which um, uh, Harriet argues um, uh, was one of the roots of env environmentalism. Right? Uh, this story, if we take Cocker's word for it, is an end point. Uh, it's the setting of a, of a, of a way of um, being with nature. And this, I'm just showing you this one again because this is the list that Dominic showed you from the book that myself and Jacob Ward edited um, and published last year on environmental history meets history of technology. And I, I tried to say, well, look, there's eight kinds of ways those two histories ten, can interact, as far as I can see. Um, and even though that was an attempt to map, map, map historiography, each one of those has narratives, right? So in the Carol Green story, we have environment as an input into a technological system and the environment as being something made into a technological system. Well, that's what the dam is doing. For, for ICI, it's, it's, it's reworking the water supply so it becomes part of the technological system for making ammonia. Is it some environment, something, uh, something changed, usually damaged? Well, for, the, for Margaret Bradshaw, for sure, yeah? and for the, the botanists opposing it in the 60s, for sure. Environment is something alongside or untouched by artifice. Well, there's plenty of wilderness talk in the way that places like Cal Greens are represented even though they are actually worked human, they're worked artificial landscapes. There's, there's remnants of lead mining, for example, all over that landscape once you look. So these, I think, do, just coming back to this, I do think this, this we, can be, we, can, we can start producing typologies, mm -hmm. we can start thinking about types of narratives, and we can start wondering what we do when we have these narratives that don't cohere and don't unfold in ways that immediately make our lives a simple story to tell. Okay. Thank you.